Consciousness school of the Buddhist teaching is also called the Yogacara, the Yogacara school. And that school of thought, as um, spoken by the Buddha, is very scholarly and very academic. And it deals with psychology a lot. And in a lot of cases, it also deals with logic. Um, ancient Indian logic. The, the, the Indian philosophy has a lot of logic in it and that originated more than 3,000 years ago before the Western civilization advocated uh, logic, uh, symbolic logic and uh, ordinary uh, regular logic and so on and so forth. So this school of thought required, sometimes required the, the audience to understand a little bit about Buddhism before they understand what I'm talking about. Because there are a lot of psychological terms in it uh, that you really have to understand. But if you want to understand Buddhist, the Buddhist teaching, you have to have some knowledge of what consciousness is all about. If you call Buddhism a religion, this religion is not about faith to God. This religion is about studying your consciousness, your mind, in relationship to your environments, in, le in the relationship to each other, and in relationship to society, internationally and nationally. In other words, relationships and uh, analysis of consciousness. And um, in order to understand consciousness, in order to understand the Buddhist teaching, we have to know uh, what is cosmic existence. So these are sentient beings, but what's the meaning of sentient beings? Let's directly get into what is the meaning of sentient beings. Now we analyze the whole world, the whole existence is sentient beings and non-sentient beings. 有情众生, 无情众生. So sentient beings are beings with consciousness. You have consciousness, I have consciousness, a dog, a cat, a rat, all animals have consciousness. And each sentient being is composed of the five aggregates, the scanters, matter, sensation, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. So these are the five aggregates we're talking about, the body and mind. So what are these, what, what do you mean by matter, sensation, perception, mental formations and consciousness? We'll get deeper into it later. Up to this point, you should know that the Buddhist teaching, it's really a very sophisticated philosophy. It's not just about just meditation and prostrating and burning incense, offering flowers and believing in God as a Buddha. No, that's not what the Buddhist religion is all about. First of all, you have to understand yourself and your relationship with all others. That's the first step in understanding the Buddhist teaching. It starts, it starts from the basic up to the very wise, to the wisdom level. So, five aggregates, matter, sensation, perception, mental formations, and sometimes you call mental formations volition, volitional actions, volitional speech. That we'll, we'll get into it later, but you know that sentient beings have consciousness, and sentient being is a combination of body and mind. If you, if you only have a body and you have no mind, you're not a sentient being. So you have a body and a mind. Matter here refers to for example, uh, your senses, your skin, your bone, your hair, the, the molecules part of it, the elements part of it, uh, the material part of it. And sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness refers to the immaterial part of it, or, or some people will call it the spirituality part of it. 
So the mind, the, the, the mentality of it, we are a combination of that. Why do we have to study this in the Buddhist teaching? Because you cannot liberate yourself from suffering and mental afflictions unless you know how you think, unless you know how people think. Because everything originates from the mind. It is the mind that induces the suffering. If you only have a body, you have no feelings, you don't have suffering. So in order to relieve yourself from suffering, relieve yourself from samsara, life and death and reincarnations, you have to understand your own consciousness. And when you understand your own consciousness, which is polluted consciousness, you have a chance to purify your consciousness into wisdom. And when you have that wisdom, with that wisdom, you practice until you get to nirvana, which is liberated from samsara, liberated from suffering, mental afflictions, liberated from reincarnations. Then you are in nirvana. We all do it with a purpose. We do it because we want to understand ourselves. Do you understand yourself? Okay. Third, they are not enlightened and are thus confined to death, rebirth, and dukkha, suffering, and all other characteristics of samsara. Of course, there are samsara characteristics like impermanence, sufferings, mental afflictions, and mental afflictions include your jealousy, your hatred, your greediness, your depressions, all those. We want to liberate from them. Not just about blind faith to Buddha. Buddha said, don't believe in it un unless you really understand what the content is. So that's the sentient beings. And sentient beings have the intrinsic Buddha nature, which when realized through enlightenment, can transcend the conditions of samsara, thereby attaining Buddhahood. So every sentient being has the potential of being the Buddha. Some people like to call it the God. You have that potential to be the God in you. So just to summarize sentient beings, that's sentient beings. Now what are non-sentient beings? Non-sentient beings have no consciousness. A piece of rock, mineral, metal. Non-sentient beings only matter, no cognition. No cognitions, they cannot cognize and they cannot, they cannot feel happy or feel sad or mental afflictions. Like they don't have any jealousy, hatred, greediness. Or they don't have that. Unenlightened, not considered to be in, in samsara, but going through a cycle of living, such as photosynthesis, plants, they don't experience, they just respond. We, sentient beings, we react, we interact. This plans, they respond. Plans are not sentient beings, but they move too. Why? Because they respond to external stimuli. They need a response. Like for the citizen, put a plan in there, and you put the sunlight in there, they will go where the sunlight is going. Where they, where they, will, they will try to get to the sunlight, to get to the water. Now that's not life, that is that is photosynthesis, that is a response to external stimuli, stimulus. So you have to know that sentient beings and non-sentient beings, we are living in a world with these two categories. You, sentient being, all others are building the more, the concrete, more material, they are non-sentients. And we are studying now the sentient beings. And if you get to a, a little higher level, which I would like to mention now, if you don't understand it it, it, it does not matter because in the future you would. If ascension being become enlightened, everything is ascension being. If the ascension being is enlightened, everything is enlightened, even a rock, anything concrete. When you are enlightened, there's nothing that is not enlightened. A molecule is enlightened. An atom is enlightened. A river is enlightened. When you are enlightened, you look at the river, the river is enlightened. 
The air is enlightened. Nothing is not enlightened when you come to that level. But right now, let's study just sentient beings. So we sentient beings have six, ten rams. The six whirlings are those that are not enlightened. And the four are enlightened. In my previous um, slide, I said sentient beings are not enlightened, but there are sentient beings who are enlightened already. That these are the four sages who are enlightened. The Pratyaka Buddha, the Stravakas, the Bodhisattva, and the Buddha. Now these are the stages of enlightenment. A Pratyaka Buddha and Stravakas, Arahat, Anagaman, Sakharitagaman, Shodapana, all these are enlightened in different levels, but they are already out from life and death. They are out from samsara. The Buddha is the highest nirvana, enlightenment stage. So these, we're not in there. We are here. We are the wellings. In our world with desire, there are also heavens, the six levels of heavens. And of course, above the six level of heavens with desire, there are still 28 heavens of different level in different galaxies. Now, heavenly beings are those, some people call them guardian angels or people in heaven. Uh, people in heaven, they're, they're classified into two, two kinds too. It's just like people. Some people are good, some are good human beings and bad human beings. They're good heavenly beings and relatively not that good human be, uh, heavenly beings. But these heavenly beings are much better than us already. They are heavenly beings. So the heavenly beings, the Azuras, are also heavenly beings, but they, they are not as benevolent as the heavenly beings. And there are the human beings, we are the human beings. Now these are the three virtuous realms, the good realms. And these are the three unvirtuous or non-virtuous realms. Departed spirits, and sometimes we call them ghosts, animals realms, and hell beings, victims of hell. The, the people suffering and victims of hell, they're also people, uh, sentient beings reincarnated into the animal realms or the depart spirits realms, which are, some people call them the ghosts. We are in here, we're the human beings. So we have to identify our location. We, in order to understand something, we have to know where we stand. Where do we stand in the cosmic existence? We stand as the, one of the six whirlings. And we want to move up here. The Buddha, 2,600 years ago, there was an enlightened sentient being who take the form, reincarnated as a prince, and try to introduce methods to get here, to be the sages. So he tried to introduce methods so that all these six whirlings can get into the enlightenment level. So in order to know more about where do we stand as human beings? We need to know how the universe is constructed, how, the, how cosmic existence is structured. We need to know the hierarchy. We need to know how many levels of existence. Where are they, all these cosmic structures? And uh, see if we can understand it with a slide. So we have three levels in these three planes of existence. Of course, the highest level is the Buddha, Arahat and Pratyaka Buddha. They are already out from cosmic existence. We don't call them existence anymore because existence is a dualistic concept. The meaning of existence is because there's non-existence. So there's always a dualistic concept in it. But in here, there's no such thing as existence. It's already out from existence. Other than that, we have three levels in cosmic structure. The first level is the Kama Dattu. Dattu means a vast uh, place, a location. That's the Sanskrit word. Kama, that means desire. The world with material and desire. This is the world we live in. Material, all those materials that we have, including sound, smell, and all that. And desire, every sentient being has desire. They are in six levels, as we just mentioned. We have the devas, or the heavenly angels. Azuras, they are heavenly beings, but they are not as high as the, the devas. Humans, 
animals, ghosts, and hell. Briefly summarize, sentient beings, when they're living, they always committed unwholesome deeds, then their own karma would bring them into the next reincarnation, which is in the form of animal or ghost or hell. So in other words, where you go to after you die, strictly depend on what you have done. What kind of karma you created for yourself. What kind of karmic energy you created. If you have always been doing unwholesome acts, deeds, creating unwholesome energy, then that karmic unwholesome energy would, would bring you to where you reincarnate, not God. Your own energy pull you to where you're going. So be mindful of what you've done, because what you have done is what you will turn out to be. You have the destiny in your own hands. How about humans, Azuras and Devas? Beings who observe at least one of the five precepts. Humans are those in the previous life that they have done some good and some bad deeds. They may be always killing, but then they are abstaining from sexual misconduct, or they are lying, or some of people are honest. Every, all individuals are different in their personality and what they have performed. So humans, they've done a mixture of good and bad deeds. That's why you're humans. If you do more good deeds than bad deeds, you may be a better human than the others. How come some people are richer, some people look better, some people have, are healthier, some people, they have different pride in, in, in their life, in their livelihood, because they did different things. They created their own destiny. Azuras are beings who observe more precepts. In other words, they, they've done more good deeds, benevolent deeds, than the humans. Devas, of course, they have done the most, many, many good deeds, but they are still in samsara. So in other words, going to heaven is not ultimate place you should go. For those who have done all the good deeds, their calm energy would pull them to heaven. They will enjoy millions of years of happiness. But once the calm energy is gone, they reincarnate back again into the six paths of reincarnation. So heaven is not the ultimate way to go. They are still in rebirth. But that's already much, much better than hell, ghosts, animals, and all that, humans. So that's still in the world of desire. All these is because they have desire. The desires of greediness, hatred, jealousy, um, sex, sex, and all that. We'll analyze that in those in details. So that's the karma, the, 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 the karma datu, the world of desire. That's where we're living now. The most dominant desire in this karma, karma, karma datu is the sexual desire. That's very difficult to eliminate. There are two things, two acts in this world that dominate people. Sexual desire and killing. Human beings have been killing for food. They kill animals for food. Ducks, chicken, fish, lobsters, you name them. They, they've done killing every day. They're in pursuit of sexual desire and the fulfillment of, of, of it every day. And sexual desire is the most difficult to eliminate. And killing is the easiest to commit. That's why we're always in samsara. And the reason why a sentient being, once if he can eliminate sexual desire, He's on the right step to enlightenment. But most people think sex with desire is a normal behavior. It isn't. It is a behavior that always dominates you in the world of desire. And you know what originates from sex with desire? Killing, lying. A lot of other bad deeds could originate from sex with desire and its fulfillment. 
That's the world with desire. And a higher level than this world of desire is the rupa dattu. Rupa means molecule, means matter, because body cell is a combination of molecules. Rupa is form, matter. Dattu is the place was still with molecules. In other words, you can still see forms. You still have a body, but no more desire. They are already in a much higher level. They enjoy millions of years of longevity. They have extreme happiness because they don't have desire. They live in Zen, in meditation. They live in concentration. So that's what we call the first heaven, the other heaven. So these heavens are already much better heavens than the devas' heavens. First, dhyana heaven. Dhyana is concentration, deep peace of mind, a peace of mind heaven. Now these devas, they are in heaven, but they still have desire. But these people in the first dhyana heaven, no desire anymore. Second is higher level, high, much higher level, and then fourth is higher level. But still have material. They still have material. In other words, they still have a form. They still have a body form. But they enjoy much happiness because there's no more desire. That's the Rupa Dattu. Beings who observe the ten wholesome deeds, who observe all the wholesome deeds that the devas observe, plus meditation. So if you do, have done all the good deeds, plus meditation, you are at a much higher level. You are here. First, third, second, third, and fourth. You only perform good deeds, you are in here, which is a lower level. Because these devas, they lack concentration, they lack meditation. So this is the world of material. People living in this world, which is world of desire, whereas they don't have any desire, they already have a saint. In other words, they already march the saintly path. You know what those people are? Who are they? They are the monks. They are the nuns. They eliminated their desire, the sexual desire, and they pursue the holy path. Not until you eliminate your desire can you get out from the desire realm. That's why we have big shoes and big shoe knees. We have the monks and nuns who have determined that they want to get out from the world of suffering, get out from samsara. Okay, higher level is arupadattu, which is the world without material, only consciousness, not even the molecules left. We suffer because we have a body. When we do not have a body, we don't suffer. Do you come to realize that concept? If you don't have a body, how can you become sick? If you don't have a body, how would you go through all these operations? of your internal organ, of your skin, of your skull, of your bone. If you don't have a body, you're free. But you cannot get out from your body. You are comically tied to your body. You cannot get out. You cannot get out from that jail, from that prison. That prison locks you in by your own karmic energy. Break it. Break the prison wall and liberate yourself out. That's what the Buddha is talking about. Break it until there's no more material left, no more prison wall left. First of all, no more desires, because desires get you into trouble. Then, get out from the prison, break your, the jail wall, and then you only have consciousness left. That consciousness is not ordinary consciousness. That is purified consciousness only consciousness, then you are the enlightened sentient being with the purified consciousness, getting out from samsara, getting out from rebirth, sufferings, mental afflictions. So do you want to get out from all these? Do you want to get out from desires, get out from form, with the purest consciousness, becoming the arahat and the Buddha? You are just that. And there are already many sentient beings in this level. There are already millions of Buddha, millions of Arahat and Bodhisattvas over the millions of years 
immeasurable number of years. There are just occasionally the Buddha who came to reincarnate in this world and tell us what you should do. Our historical Buddha was Sakamuni Buddha, who was born, take the form of a, of, of a prince, and told you how to get out from there. The next coming future Buddha, Maitreya Buddha, the Buddha with the big belly, the happy Buddha. He's going to be the next in the future Buddha. There are always some saints coming back to save people. It's just like there are some priests or monks who always go to jail and tell the prisoners what they should do to get out from there. Because they also experience their life in jail. They don't want their comrades to suffer. They always go back to tell them, get out from prison. They're occasionally Buddhas like that. And the world is not just of this world. There are millions of Buddhas who go to different world. There, 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 there are millions and millions of monks and priests who go to all prison, different prisons and tell them, be better and get out. Free yourself from there. You still have a chance. You still have a chance to get out. Why are, why are you satisfied with your own prison? You are, are you happy? Prisoners who have all their life been there, they don't know what is happiness. They thought that getting some good food is happiness. It's just like when a worm is getting into the soil, enjoying the, the, uh, the, the nutrients of the soil is the most happiest mo moment. But then to the dragon who fly in the sky, getting to the sky and, 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 and is much better happiness than absorbing the nutrients in the soil. When you are a frog in the bottom of a well, you don't know what sky it is all about. You only see that circle and you thought that circle is the sky. Until somebody told a frog, hey froggy, do you know that that's not the only sky? That's only a circle, a little, a minute little portion of that sky. The sky is it's immeasurable. The frog doesn't believe it because he has been confined to that well. And what do we do next? We'll have all these various different questions that we'd like to address. What and who is this so-called sentient being? Who am I? Where do I come from? Why was I born? Why are individuals different in body and mind, lifestyle, life history, standard of living, personality, health, wealth, family relationships? intelligence, life expectancy, and so on. Why are they all different? We pro into that. We want answers to these questions. Not just about blind faith to Buddha. Buddha blessed me with all the blessings I want. It's about studying yourself, your own self in the Buddhist teaching. And when in the process of studying it, you open up your wisdom, your insight. So we said we are sentient being with body and mind. And what is this body? The body will have the sensory organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue. And then we have the body, which includes the hair, the bodily hair, nails, teeth, skin, all these 37 different organs of the body. So you are this body. And then with the mind, your perception, your conception, your mental formation, and your consciousness. Why do we bring this out? because the Buddhist teaching studies sentient being in detail. We want to know form. We want to know what, in, in the world of desire, the dominant uh, misconception that we have in our mind is we think that life is beautiful. Body is beautiful. Body is sexy. Body is something that you want. But the Buddha said, no. The body is impure. The body is imperfect, as imperfect as the whole world. And what is the body make up of? What is the body make up of? The body that you attach so much importance to. Let's analyze it then you know how ugly the body is. It does not mean that we're negative. We can adopt a positive, happy attitude to life. But we have to understand the core iron facts of suffering of life. 
In spite of all these sufferings, we still love to live. We still love to enlighten ourselves and enlighten other people. We are positively living, pursuing. But looking at the iron facts of suffering, we know these are sufferings. It's two things. We're not negative. We are positively negative. We are, we are enthusiastically negative and positive. Well, the time is up. I don't know. There's still a lot more I have to say. The next time, what I would do is we'll analyze the body and mind. We will get to know all our consciousnesses. We have to know. We want to know how our eyes see things, how our ears listen to things. Our nose smell, how the senses work. When your senses are interacting with environments, how do they work? How do we attach to things? And where does this karmic energy get stored? How do we get it reincarnate? What is that thing that reincarnates? What is that energy? How do we purify the energy? How do you make? How do we understand life more? How do we make ourselves happy and make all our our fellows happy? How do we enjoy life in spite of sufferings?